So thank you, Mary, for uh, inviting me to be here tonight. I'm here to speak to you about Brexit and museums. Um, I haven't been here for quite as long as Claire. I came to Liverpool in 2007, uh, first to do PhD research in collaboration with Tate Liverpool. And since taking up my role at Liverpool Hope University six years ago now, um, I've worked very closely with National Museums Liverpool. So I do know the, the National Museums in the, in the city very well. Um, so, how will Brexit affect museums? I don't know. <laughs> um, nobody knows. But there has been a good deal of commentary and a little bit of research um, since the referendum, which tries to predict how it might. Um, so, I've taken my brief very literally tonight. I have five points that I hope to cover in ten minutes, so um, bear with me. Um, and the first point that I'd like to discuss is funding. So, rightly, museums are concerned with um, what Brexit means for funding, and in particular what it means for European funding. Um, especially with the kind of spectre of no deal um, continually on the horizon, um, museums are concerned about whether they will have access to European Regional Development Funds, as many museums in Liverpool have. We don't have to look too far to, to see the Museum of Liverpool, to see uh, Merseyside Maritime Museum, Tate Liverpool, who have all benefited from that European funding. Um, and European funding, although it's not a regular source of income for museums in the city, is a very crucial factor in the kind of portfolio of support that museums need for capital developments like that. But as Claire said, culture isn't all about buildings, and museums also receive uh, project funding um, for international projects from um, funds like Creative Europe, Horizon 2020 and so on. So all of those funds are seen at, as at risk by museums. So that's just getting us started with European funding. If we think about the role of culture and museums on the American side and we think about um, the things that Claire spoke to us about like the um, income generation in terms of tourism and so on, um, museums on Merseyside have very much developed in that kind of regeneration, uh, culture-led regeneration uh, role. And actually, if um, especially again, if, if there's no deal, um, the way that um, cities like Liverpool will be undermined in terms of tourism will also have an effect on the type of funding that um, museums are able to generate for themselves. So self-generated income through ticket sales, through cafes, through uh, bookshops and so on. Now, the wider economic uncertainty, um, the funding that comes regularly from national governments for national museums, from local governments for local museums, from um, arms length bodies like the Arts Council, is also seen to be at risk. And all of this is on top of a decade of austerity that the museums have already faced. And again, museums on the side are no stranger to that um, reduced funding over the past decade and have lost many staff and have seen reductions in programmes as well. Um, as a result of that austerity, so they're already on the back of foot. Um, so that's funding, the first point that I wanted to discuss. The second point that I'd like to discuss is staffing. And again, uh, first and foremost, museums are concerned about their European staff <coughs> and um, the terms of their settlement in the UK, depending on what um, format Brexit eventually takes. And um, aside from that, they're also concerned with the mobility of their staff. So the ability of their staff to be able to work on international projects, particularly in the EU, um, and whether they'll be able to um, attract the type of expert staff that they will need in the future. There are limitations on um, the European uh, staff that they can employ, um, particularly as museums as a sector don't pay that well. And even the kind of expert roles like curators and so on tend to be under that kind of um, free or £30,000 threshold that is now going to be required for a long-term working visa. Um, so that is staffing. Um, the third point that I'd like to discuss is um, borders. And um, obviously there's been a lot of um, talk about borders, uh, particularly in Northern Ireland, and this affects the museum sector as well. And as well as uh, the mobility of staff, there is concerns about the mobility of collections. So being able to lend and borrow objects from museum collections to institutions in the EU and to borrow them from institutions in the EU. Um, and again, this is uh, like with most questions about the border, 
been sharply felt in Northern Ireland. There was some research done by the Irish Museum Association and Ulster University a couple of years back um, that said that the kind of cross-border um, or all-island partnerships that have been developed um, since the 1998 peace agreement um, have, have been put at risk by, by Brexit and by the um, uncertainty about the border arrangements. So um, perhaps not one that will be felt so sharply on Merseyside. Although, come to think of it, Merseyside does punch above its way in terms of national institutions. And national institutions are the ones that tend to do most of that international lending um, rather than the smaller regional museums. So again, borders might be something that um, affects Merseyside as, as well as um, Nor Northern Ireland um, quite sharply. So the, the fourth point that I want to discuss, um, the points that I've discussed so far, I think, are probably familiar to you all. They're, they're points that will be uh, concerned across the public sector. So we're thinking about them in education. I know I have friends who are thinking about the same issues, border staffing, um, funding and healthcare. So, um, so far, so familiar. Uh, the fourth point that I want to discuss is probably one that's more unique to museums, and that is the civic role that museums can play in Brexit and the aftermath of Brexit. And um, the director of the UK Museum Association, Sharon Hill, uh, um, I think early March, when, when that um, spectre of, of no deal was looming large, um, made a statement where she said uh, her most, uh, her biggest concern about Brexit was um, the damaging division uh, to the communities that museums serve. And she said, as um, institutions that deal with um, identity, particularly identity as it relates to place, um, museums can play a role in healing those divisions. And this is what I mean by the, the civic role that museums can play. Now, I am in agreement with, with, with Sharon Hill that museums are kind of uniquely placed to um, provide a forum for contemplation and for discussion of, of social and political issues, both historical and contemporary. Um, However, I think museums face a number of challenges if they want to provide a forum in which divided communities can come together and, and heal those divisions. There are a number of challenges that they, they will need to kind of at least consider. And this brings me on to point five, which is museums are not politically neutral institutions. Um, and in particular, um, one of the issues that I want to raise is something that's come through um, both the research that's been done by the Federation of Creative Industries and research that's been done by the Arts Council of England on the impact of Brexit, um, which is that um, by and large, the museum workforce is, is pro-European, uh, doesn't want to leave the EU. So um, the dice is already really loaded there. If the museum wants to create a kind of forum for discussion among divided communities, Museum staff are really going to have to challenge themselves to maybe step outside of their own way of thinking and to empathise um, with the reasons why maybe people did vote to leave the EU. Um, to, you know, I'm um, someone who um, strongly believes the UK should remain in the EU, but it's, it's not impossible for me to think um, about why someone would want to vote to save the NHS, or why someone would want to vote for better employment opportunities, all of these things which are promised in the run-up to the referendum. Um, I say promised rather than fulfilled. Um, so the museum staff are going to be challenged to think in a different way and to think about um, how to create a forum in which all of those different voices can be heard. And, and secondly, uh, the second challenge is that the museum's visitor profile doesn't necessarily reflect the wider public either. Um, now, the big caveat here is obviously that visitor profiles vary from museum to museum. And I know, even from my work with National Museums Liverpool, that um, the type of audience that's attracted by the Walker Art Gallery is very different to the type of audience that's attracted by the World Museum Liverpool. And they're literally just steps away from each other. Um, but by and large, um, it has been the case and continues to be the case that museums tend to attract uh, the more wealthy, more well-educated, more highly skilled um, people in society and struggle to attract 
um, less wealthy, um, less well-educated, less skilled visitors, or to use the terms that museums themselves use in, in their kind of visitor research, um, they struggle to attract the C2, DE uh, social economic groups. So um, with, with both of those kind of skews, if you like, in mind, both in terms of the museum workforce and the museum visitor profile, it's going to be very difficult um, to create a forum in which all voices in those divided communities can be heard. So that's a bit of a challenge, really, that museums face. So to end on a bit of a positive note, um, if museums do take up this challenge, and I think there is a role particularly for museums of social history, whether that's the Museum of Liverpool or whether it's um, People's History Museum in Manchester, uh, to um, create a forum for this type of debate. Um, if they do take up that mantle, if they do make it their mission to do that, even if museums can promote a kind of a tolerance and a, an understanding among the people that do visit, even if they don't reach all um, sectors or all um, groups in society. Because the challenge here isn't necessarily assimilation. It's not about bringing everyone around to the way we think or the way museum staff think, but, but to promote dialogue, to, to give um, people an opportunity to have a conversation about why did you vote for Brexit? Why, why did you um, vote uh, to remain? Um, and uh, only in that way will, will the wounds heal. So I think if, if museums can even reach the people that are visiting them now and promote a kind of um, an understanding and a tolerance of, of, of different political views, then those conversations will happen. And it's only through those conversations happening, I think, that the eventual conversations about um, well, who has actually benefited from this will begin to happen. When that binary breaks down between you voted to leave, you voted to remain, when that binary breaks down and people actually ask about who has benefited from all of this, I think without getting too political tonight in the run-up to the elections, that's where the really interesting conversations start to happen. Um, so I'll leave you on that note. Thank you. Thank you.